So my question was, will an Explore Scientific 127ED uh, APO triplet fit onto the Twilight One mount? Um, the answer is yes, it will. Is it low? Yeah, it's a bit low. Uh, remember, all you'll be doing here is most likely looking at planets with a scope. Um, if you want to look at deep sky, you probably use a daub anyway. Uh, I know it is actually a nice uh, low power refractor for looking at nebula and uh, M13 globular clusters, things like that. But um, once you're pointing this thing overhead on that mount, it's going to be pretty hard to find stuff. And a right angle finder would probably help, but I've tried it before, it's not ideal that way. So for me, this would be a setup for looking at planets that are parading in front of me to the south. That'd be uh, what we've been doing lately anyway with Jupiter and Saturn in the sky, and obviously the moon too. Uh, some razor sharp images in the moon with a scope. But I just wanted to see if this uh, mount can handle it. It's rated right on the, on the weight limit. I think it's rated at 20 pounds. The scope and accessories probably uh, just sitting on 20 pounds. Um, definitely is quite a waggle from the scope so you're not going to be using you're not going to be doing a bunch of high power observing with this let's just see how she looks now yeah I can see the if you can see the movement there if you were to look at 250x that'd be completely unusable right but for like you know 75 150 i think it'll actually work fine just once you let it settle down it's got the slow-mo controls there um what else i want to do is actually just point it, uh, in the distance there there's actually a beach across the way um, yes, you can't see that it's a beach. Below the mountain, across the water, there's a, a white ribbon. That's actually the beach. It's Purpose Bay Beach and it's about three and a half kilometers away. So uh, earlier on in the video, I was looking through the glass here. You see there's two doors in the way, the uh, sliding door and the glass behind it. Um, we're actually looking through that. So I'll close the door so we're looking through one pane of glass and just see you know, what it looks like. Just a rough idea looking through the scope. But yeah, it actually sits in the mount okay. Um, I wasn't sure if I'd even get it on there. Um, the Twilight One mount can develop a little bit of play and last night I took apart the head. It's pretty simple. Once you remove the, the head from the tripod and just undo the bolt down here, undo the central column here and then the head comes off. Uh, underneath the head here there's three bolts, uh, three hex bolts. You loosen them off, take them off uh, and actually it separates this bit, this bit here from the rotating part. And then you'll actually see the central bolt that's controlling the amount of uh, friction between this part and this part. And it was less than a quarter turn. It's a 10 millimeter bolt. I put less than a quarter turn on it. I felt it go tight. And I just moved the mount around by hand. And I thought, wow, that's taking a ton of play out. Before that, it was rocking side to side. It wasn't safe for the scope. Uh, and now practically all the play is gone. And it still moves pretty, pretty smoothly. So it was an easy fix. I'll put some still images there to show you what that was like. And I'll stop here. So here's the scope, uh, really unusually running in terrestrial viewing trim here. So uh, you can see it's pretty close tolerance there, but it's not touching, it's fine. Um, the little finder, the little uh, slow motion control here comes off and there's no pressure. But uh, I would actually just watch it doesn't contact the mount, like it is right there, it's pretty close. Um, it's actually looking slightly down and that's, that's interesting because I'm probably about 450 feet above the waterline, um, above sea level. And the beach that's looking at across there is obviously at sea level, but it's three and a half kilometers away. So I thought the angle would be way more slight than that. But just that slight downward slope is what it takes to look down at sea level at a distance of three and a half kilometers. So come around the back here. I'm just happy to be in a uh, have a nice view here from the the window and pretty handy look across. There's all sorts of features over there on the top of the mountain. There's a uh, I call it the listening post. I think it's a weather station. It's quite remote. Um, it's actually behind this first level of mountains on the top of the other ones. Um, kind, of, kind of in the V there you'll see there's a mountain in the distance and on the top of that one is this um, um, listening post or weather station as I call it. But anyway, I just want to show you the setup here. Slow motion controls. It's absolutely fine for looking through. The, there's no big waggle. But if you were at high power on a planet it wouldn't be so good. So, But anyway, it is possible to do some terrestrial viewing. Let's see if we can come up to the finder here see what we can see through the finder. Oh with the camera phone it's not too brilliant you know the view through the finder on the moon and things like that is really really good like it's a six degree I think it is and very very sharp and the reticle is illuminated but it's got a hole in the center so you don't cover the stars that you're trying to align on so that's the view through the finder and then if I go up to the main scope it's the 18mm eyepiece again 
it's quite a nice um quite a nice power on that let's have a look here it looks like it probably needs a clean actually oh we can swing the phone around here mm. just resting on the eye piece try and get the right orientation uh, you're only getting like a partial field of view with the phone here like it's a way way wider field of view when you look through with your eye Okay, we're looking through one pane of glass now. So don't take the image quality as any indication. It's way, way sharper than that. It's really a razor sharp view if you're looking through uh, air, and not through glass. But just to show you the image scale, so like I say, this three and a half kilometers away, you saw through the finder and without anything, how far away that is. And you can see colors really well. You know, without the glass, I'm pretty sure you could recognize people on the beach. I could actually see their faces, but a little bit blurred. Um, so and it's just a just a good idea of the image scale you get with that kind of distance. And again, I'll just come up here for a normal view. And let's zoom the phone a little bit. And where we're looking is right over there. You can just see the beaches at the bottom of the trees. There's actually a power line above there. Let's just stop. All right, in the distance there above the uh, above the beach, above the trees, there's a cut in the mountain going vertical. It's actually the power lines. So um, let me zoom out and see if I can give you a quick look at what that would look like. There's the normal scale that you see by eye. And I'll come down to the finder, which is 8 by 50 I'm just running into the scope here with a camera, with a phone camera a little bit. So let's see if I can move around. Whoa. Yeah, so there's the scale you're getting through the finder. It's a super wide view. It's 6 degrees, so you're seeing just a, the middle portion here on the camera phone. But you can see the reticles right on the, right on the power line. Then I'll come back here. <coughs> Nighttime, I'd have the reticle turned on. Come back to the 18mm. So get the camera leaning on it. Well, I think I must have the camera zoomed. Let me unzoom it. Come round. So there's that power line in close up. I think we're on about 75x or something like that. I'll check my power chart in a second here. Yeah, the phone the phone's really colorizing the image, so like I say, don't take that as any indication of the the actual color of the scope or anything, because it's very, very sharp when you look without anything in the way. Um, sometimes at night I'll see headla headlights just shine up from there because there's little, um, right in the center of the field, um, there's actually access roads and you'll see a truck suddenly in a power line, I guess he's checking stuff, and you'll see the headlights shining from halfway up the mountain, so... Interesting. Right, just through slow-mo controls in the scope, so if I'm trying to come up here, Further up the mountain works quite well. It's really nice. It does, you know, I can see it waggling actually. So again, high power wouldn't be ideal. Um, and actually, if I just give you a quick look at the uh, power chart here, the light's not brilliant. So on the left is the eyepiece focal length and what power you get with the scope. The scope is 963 millimeters focal length. And so with that 18 mil I've got there, so it's 53x. So quite low power actually, but certainly enough to see Jupiter or Saturn. And <clears throat> That 13mm eyepiece gives me 74x or 75. That's a um, really ideal eyepiece for you know observing with people at the scope. So you can actually see some detail in Jupiter. You can see the rings of Saturn easily. And the moon would actually big. You can see uh, a lot of craters at 75x. And then if I actually want to ramp up a little bit, normally I'd have it on uh, an equator if I was going to do that. But I'm trying to simplify things and not have counterweights. So with the same 13mm instead of 74x, with the 2.5 bar low, it'd be 185x. That's a little much actually. Probably like 134 would be good. And I actually just picked up an 8mm eyepiece, so 120 normally with a scope, and then with the Barlow 240. Those are two really good powers for looking at planets, 120, 240. So that's what it is. And then for some ridiculous viewing, with a Barlow 5mm, you get 481. So, uh, and you might laugh at that, but you know, with my 6 inch um, Celestron scope and Acromat, I did actually use the 5mm and the 2.5 Barlow for 600x. I just separating uh, Jupiter's moons, and you could actually see them as round spheres. There's no detail, but just see them as round spheres just to actually see what it looked like. So just back away and again just looking at it uh, I really call this really terrestrial or casual stargazing trim. That's kind of what I'm trying to do with the scope now anyway. You know I have a 10 inch daub uh, if I want to be looking at deep sky stuff and I'm just thinking this actually works really well this mount. I thought it'd be too small but it works okay. All right, another nice feature so I've got the slow motion controls if you're looking through the scope you'd be doing this <coughs> through the find but of course you can just push it. Just push it to where you want to go. So I'm going to actually try and go up to the listening post, as I call it there, the, uh, <laughs> the weather station. And I'm just going to push it. So I'm just looking along as though it's a rifle scope, where it's pointed. And then I'll, I'll use the finder to center it up. 
All right, so I've just actually pushed it to the location and looked through the finder there to actually see the, what I'm trying to find. <laughs> see what I'm trying to find. So there's the location I'm talking about, just on the top of that mountain there. I'm just having trouble getting the camera phone here sitting on the finder. Ooh, there we go. Right where the crosshairs are is where the feature is. I'll take this away and look through the main scope. I probably should look through this first to see that it was there. It's right there. If you can see, actually, if I come around again with a orientation. There's actually a mast and a little uh, hut. It's very small. I've actually seen it on the internet what the, uh, what the hut looks like. So it's a small hut with some equipment in it. And there's a mast right there. Most of the year that's covered in snow, even through the summer. So only now this late part of summer, August, is it now not got snow. Um, I'm only on an 18mm eyepiece for 53x, so if I actually put the bar low in or put a 10mm in there, then you actually see some more detail. But again, I'm looking, I'm looking through glass. There's no practical way for me to get this in the open air. I could go on the deck, but it's uh, probably be hitting the, the veranda rail and stuff. But through glass, I think it's just as if you had a pair of binoculars in your hand. That's kind of uh, just more powerful, but you know, it's a similar casual view and thing. So that's uh, that's kind of what the scope can do. It's uh, quite versatile. As I say, really good views through the finder. M13 looks lovely through the finder. There's some, some I think is actually probably better than the main scope. But with the main scope, you can see detail of the stars. So that's it for now. Another little perspective of this, the way it's clearance and stuff are pretty, quite tight actually. Uh, only when it's only when it's horizontal like this, when the scope is pointing up, then the clearances are actually fine. And there's the, the single arm in this mount. Uh, with this mount, you have to move that arm configuration back like that if you want the scope to be pointed up. Check this out. So you can see we actually can go full vertical, almost touching the tripod leg there with the finder. But you can actually move the scope round if you really want to do that. It's not going to be great viewing like that, I think. But, you know, if M13's overhead, you might want to do that. So, quite versatile, actually. Um, if you wanted some more height, you can actually... You now, you can't do it in the fly. You have to take the equipment off, and then you'd undo the two bolts, bring the arm straight up. You get some more height, so then I would have more clears for the terrestrial viewing I'm doing. So that's really what the idea of it is. Probably this orientation is more like what I'd be doing with a scope. Like I say, looking at planets that are praying to the south. So... That's the, that's the setup. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.